Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. In the previous two videos in this series, I'd focused on building the inner frame parts for this MS-14S Gelgoog kit. And you can see those here if you want to go back uh, later or now uh, and, and take a look at the first two videos. Uh, please do that. But the inner frame parts are all painted and detailed. And as I mentioned in those videos, there's not a lot of this that is going to be seen. Um, sometimes I like just painting all of the inner parts and doing all of the, the detailing, you know, like in here, just because it's fun to do. Nobody's ever going to see it. But for me, it's just fun to do. So uh, I like doing that. But with the inner frame parts completely finished, now it's time to focus on the outer armor. For painting the armor parts, I'll be doing them separately off of the frame um, so that I don't get too much paint on the inner frame. But where I can, I'll go ahead and, like on this part here, I can get it together like that. Well, I'm supposed to be able to get it together. There we go. Way to go, Mr. YouTuber. I'll put a few parts together like that so that as I'm painting uh, these parts, there won't be there won't be any kind of break between parts. Sometimes if you paint the parts completely separate, you may get to the assembly of the model and find that you had much more saturation of color, much more opacity on one part than another. So I like where I can to put them together. Also, if you're going to do pre-shading, you'll definitely want to have parts like that together. Um, now, this is this looks like a seam line here, <laughs> but what I'm going to do uh, b just before I paint it is I'm going to just scribe in a little bit of a line there and turn it into a panel line so that I can assemble it all later and not have to worry about filling in those gaps. That's another reason I like doing these apart like that. But I'll leave that together for painting. For parts that aren't that I don't can't snap together for painting, but that would make sense to paint together, I'll just add a little bit of masking tape on the inside here to hold those together. You can also use blue tack, just anything to hold them together, and then I can paint them as one unit. And one, that'll help mask off the inside, but two, it'll make sure that, that uh, everything looks even along here with the coloring. Other pieces, I'll just paint as they are. And what I'll do is I'll just use creative angles to make sure that I'm not painting parts that I don't want painted. Because this whole interior here is finished, and I don't want to get any paint on that. So when I'm shooting with my airbrush, I'll shoot, uh, you know, say from this angle this way, so that I can get this whole piece here, but it will mask off the inside. And then I'll just shoot here and here. You can go in if you want and take the time to mask it. And if there are any parts that I feel like I'm not going to be able to avoid hitting what's on the inside without masking, I'll mask it. But one of the things I do uh, from time to time is I'll actually do what I call, and this is just a term I use in my own head, I'll, use, I'll, I'll call it progressive masking. So like if I'm going to be shooting from this direction here, and I don't want to get any paint over here, I'll stick a piece of tape right across there, and then I'll paint from over here, and then when I turn it around, I'll pull this piece of tape off, tape off, move it over here, and paint from this side. So in that way, I can use just one piece of tape um, to mask off uh, whole sections and just kind of move it around as I go. And then on other pieces like this, it's just going to be uh, making sure that if there's a part in the way like that, that I just fold it down, and then I get all of it in there, and I just pay attention to the angles. I can just simply spray from this angle and get everything along here and then spray from this angle and get everything along there. And because I'm using a .3 nozzle airbrush, it's not blowing paint everywhere. It's just going to be a fairly tight, confined area and, uh, and it'll help me control that. At least that's the theory. <laughs> now the two paint colors that I'm going to be using for this model are both from Mr. Color, Gundam Color. Um, Char's pink and Char's red, and they they are pretty much the dead-on equivalent for the plastic. Um, they look great. I mean, 
whatever color the plastic is when you put this on it's 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 this is what it's going to look like pretty much now if i were going for a more saturated look to the colors um, if i were going to try and do a really clean finish on this gunpla i would actually go ahead and just put these this this paint uh, down over either the bare plastic and i could clean up this overspray with just a little bit of q-tips and alcohol I would either put it over the bare plastic or I would put it over a white primer because that's going to give you a really bright saturated look. I'm wanting something to be a little, want it to be a little more desaturated, a little more of a grungy look because I'm going to weathering, uh, be weathering this guy pretty good. So I'm going to put down a coat of gray paint or primer rather um, so that when I put this over it, it's going to give me some options for uh, distressing effect which I'll demonstrate and and uh, just giving me a more desaturated weathered look so before you put your paint down think about what it's going to go over um, how is it going to cover those things what's going to be the difference in tone when you put paint if you just go straight for the paint between here and here you can use this paint lacquer paint I've done it a lot without priming now I always say, if you're not sure whether you should prime or not, prime. There's no harm in priming. But quite often, um, these lacquer paints, they'll actually adhere better to the model than acrylic primers. Um, so these things are fairly much rock solid. Um, so you can put these on without priming. But what again, what priming brings to the table is like, for example, on a piece like this, you may have to build up quite a, quite a number of paint layers for this pink to cover up this black and have the exact same tone as this. But if you prime over this, with it, whether it's white or gray or black or um, another red or something like that, when you prime over it and then put the paint down, you're starting with an even tone so you'll know that you'll get an even undercoating. Now, if you want to do pre-shading and all of that stuff, go ahead and do that ahead of time and then put your paint down. But I'm going to get started on painting this guy and uh, show you on a few pieces how that looks. I primed everything in this gray color so that it would give it a nice desaturated look. And then I buffed it out with a cotton t-shirt just to make sure that it was a nice smooth base for the later paints to go on. For the paint, I used this Gundam Color Chars Pink, which is a perfect match for the base plastic. Um, it's a great looking color and I love these lacquer paints. They go on really smooth. Uh, thinned it about 50-50 with Mr. Color Leveling Thinner, uh, which is a perfect thinner for these paints, and I highly recommend it. I applied it with my Badger uh, Extreme Patriot 105, about 18 PSI. This has a .3 nozzle, so it works really well with these lacquer paints. And then when I begin to apply it, I just, I guess you'd say scribbled it on. I wasn't going for full coverage. I wanted some of the gray to kind of poke through. I wanted some of the areas to be more desaturated than others. Uh, some were at full opacity, some were not. This began to establish a fairly modeled look for uh, the, the bits of armor that are going to go on the model. It's, it's the foundation for the weathering. It's not the final weathering, certainly, but it's a way of just giving it a patchy, faded appearance that as you put on layer laters, later layers of of weathering it just contributes to the overall look you get it all done at the beginning and uh, and you don't have to do as much to try and fade and desaturate and model that base color so you can see there it just left it looking real patchy and and started that process that more layers are going to go on top of to really give that depth of finish that I like to try and achieve uh, when I when I build these. Now the next layer was just a 50-50 mix of mobile suit white and the original pink color and I thinned these with about 70 percent thinner and about 30 percent paint so it was a little more opaque going on but I again just begin this process of scribbling and again I, I wasn't trying to completely cover up anything I didn't avoid the panel lines I just went over it, uh, gave it uh, a, a more modeled look so that it would, I, I want it to look faded, I want it to look used, I want it to look like it's been out in the sun. 
because doing it again, I sound like a broken record, but doing it now will save you time down the road. And then you can see what you end up with. It's, it's not a, a perfect, colorful finish uh, with one smooth, uniform color. There's a lot of gradients going on there. So it gives a, a really cool look to the model, and it's really going to help the weathering stages that will follow. All right, with everything painted, I got all of the components assembled and ready for the next steps. Um, now you can see how that modeling looks. It, it starts off the, the model at kind of an already weathered level. Um, I realized I forgot to paint this panel. I've still got to go back and do that panel that goes on back here. It was hidden in my box of parts. But it, it's, it's not a necessary step, but if you're going to be heavily weathering something, it stands to reason that the paint would have fading and streaking and all sorts of other things on it. So I find that it's easier to just go ahead and add that in ahead of all of the weathering so that you're, you're basically beginning the weathering process right at the base paint. But it's, it's, uh, I love the way that it, this, this process ends up making the model look. Um, when you get up close, you can kind of see the, the airbrush marks and things like that. It doesn't stand up to close scrutiny when it's just at this stage. But when later streaking is applied or um, other weathering goes over the top of it, it all begins to work together. Um, if, if you've seen my uh, Bandai AT, AT 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 Walker, video you can see between that and where I used some uh, the dot filtering technique to to really streak that and then the later weathering in those two videos um, it, you can you can really see this process at work so but what I want to do next is I'm going to give the model a gloss coat to put decals on normally I like to weather over this fairly satin it's kind of a cross between a satin and a matte surface I guess you'd say it's leaning more towards the matte than satin. I normally like to weather over that, but it's going to be much easier to put the decals on over a gloss surface. So I'll give the whole thing a gloss coat, add the decals, and then later on I'll actually go back and put a satin coat over it, which will I can then start doing the weathering over that, but that'll be in later videos. In this video, I just want to get it glossed up and get the decals on, and that will, right now as I'm thinking, it may change before the end of the video, but right now as I'm thinking, that'll be enough for this video. Did want to point out, one thing I love about the Gel Goo is these big bell-bottom pants. I mean, that's just, in my mind, that's just too cool. But you'll remember earlier me talking about that much of the detail of the frame painting wouldn't be seen. Well, this, this shows that. All of that detail that I put in, uh, in regard, with regards to coloring, uh, the different panels and the hoses and things like that, you don't see any of it. Uh, the work that I did on the, the rockets, the different colors, you don't see any of that. Now, if you took this panel off and displayed it with you know some of the frame showing, you would see that. But a lot of that, it's just purely for the fun of it and, and uh, the enjoyment of doing it uh, just, just in and of itself. But I love, I love these big bell-bottom legs that it has. So uh, I'm really excited about, about streaking and weathering these things. All right, it's the point in the build where I want to get the markings on. Um, and as you can see by this marking guide, there are quite a few on this mobile suit. The reason I want to put them on now is I, you want to put markings on before the weathering because you want the weathering to go over that. Because if you think about it, any vehicle, whether real or imagined, it's going to have, you know, it's going to come out, it's going to be in the factory, there's going to be some production going on, there's probably going to be some paint that goes on it, and then after the paint, there's either going to be some stencils or markings painted on, or put on as some kind of sticker, or vinyl thing, or whatever, and then they roll it out of the factory, and it's used. Now, you can certainly make a case for, uh, you know, I've seen models where um, maybe there would be hand-applied markings put later, and they might have less weathering on them. 
or if a certain part, I've seen this on aircraft models where, you know, a certain part of uh, the original airplane would have been repainted. And so that area may have cleaner markings. I mean, so there's, there's certainly causes where it's not a 100% rule, but in general, after you finish your base painting, you want to put on the markings, um, whether it's decals or whatever. Now, most Bandai Gunpla come with stickers. Um, they are what they are. Um, I don't know that Bandai's ever going to change that. I hope they do. You know, I wish they would include water slides with everything. But this comes with a sheet of stickers. Now, you you can use these, but here's the thing you have to understand. Each of these stickers, I don't know if you can see it in the reflection, has quite a bit of clear film around it. And when you put that on, it's going to show and it's going to leave a, a ridge. And if you try to weather over this, um, it, it, it's, it's going to look, it's going to look pretty bad. You know, now if you use these stickers over white and, um, and, and, and you don't weather over it, they can work okay. Over any darker colors, they're going to show up. So, um, my, my opinion on stickers is we don't need those stinking stickers. The kit also comes with some dry rub transfers. These are more usable. You have to be careful with them. Um, I'm not going to use these, which I'll show you why in a moment. But these can be used. Um, you can cut them out, and uh, you, you have to remove the backing off, and you you cut them out. And and what I like to do is place it um, um, in in place with with some bits of tape. Uh, holding it, holding it uh, in place, and then rub it on because the the marking is on the back of this plastic sheet. So if you if you take a piece of clear tape and put over the top and hold it down, and then you use something to rub it on there, and you have to be very thorough about it. When you pull that back up, it should leave the marking. It can be a little finicky to work with, but they do work, and they look really good when they're on there correctly. Now what I'm going to use. Or water slide decals, and these are the Bandai official ones. So they they match what's on the, um, the sticker sheet and the dry rub transfer sheet, and even the little numbers and everything match. So I can use the marking guide and the instructions to put all of these little stencils on. Now, before adding decals, I generally, especially this number of them, I generally put a gloss coat on the model, which I've done. Um, here's a leg and I gloss coated this. Now I used, um, pledge floor polish, uh, future floor polish. I, I like it. I've used it for years. It works good for me. You can use any gloss you want. The, the kind of gloss you use is less important than the fact that you end up with a glossy surface. Now, the reason you want a glossy surface is water slide decals will go down better against a smooth surface than against a textured surface. If you're putting it over flat paint, even if to the touch it feels um, uh, smooth, there's going to be some texture on there which can trap air bubbles underneath it. And there's film around most decals. And that those air bubbles can show up. And when you later, if you matte coat the model, it's going to show up as shiny silver spots. It's going to reflect light. So having having a nice... Um, glossy surface is going to make it much easier to put your decals down. If I'm only putting on a few, um, sometimes I won't gloss coat the whole model. I'll simply put a drop of future of gloss coat where I'm going to put the decal and put the decal on top of that and then do my normal setting solutions and things like that. But it's important to, to make sure your model is gloss coated before you put the decals on and they'll go down much, much easier. All right, the tools I'm going to use are fairly standard. I've got my hobby knife to cut the decals off the sheet. I've got a piece of paper towel and some Q-tips to soak up any excess water or setting solutions. I've got a couple of brushes for applying setting solutions. I'm going to be preparing the surface with this micro set, which I'll put on before the decal. And then after it's on and had a little bit of time to dry, I'm going to put on this solve a set because it makes decals snuggle. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's a great, it's a great setting solution. You can use Microsol, which is the other 
half of this of this of the duo from Microscale. Um, for my, I've always thought it's just a little too weak. I like Solvaset because it's a little hotter, um, and I think it does a better job. But any setting solution you like using is going to work. But um, this is pretty standard for just about any time that I put on decals on a model. Something else I forgot to mention, off camera, I have a coffee cup full of hot water, and it's sitting on a coffee warmer, um, a little coffee warming plate about that big around, um, just big enough for the coffee cup to sit on. I like using warm water when I'm working with decals because they decals will come off the backing paper much quicker, much easier with warm water than with cold water. There, there have been some decals that I can put in cold water and it will take them 30 to 40 seconds to loosen up from the backing paper. Generally in warm water, it's within five seconds. Now, you do have to be careful. You can't just leave them floating in there forever or the decal will fairly quickly float right off the backing paper and that can be infuriating to try and get a hold of. But um, warm water, and if you ask how warm, it's coffee warm. Um, you know, it, it's if, if I wanted to drink this water, I could. It's, it's the temperature that you normally drink coffee at. So it's, it's a fairly, fairly warm water. All right, I'm going to start off putting this decal here on the shoulder. And uh, what I've done is I've just stuck it up on this little piece of uh, modeling putty, model, or clay, modeling clay, so that it holds it at the right angle. Because it, it can be kind of tough to just leave it sitting on the desk and trying to get at it that way. So... I've got this, and I'm going to do this in real time so you can get a sense of how long I hold it in the water, which is what I'm doing now. Off camera, I've got it in the water, and I'm going to let that sit on there for just a little bit, and then I'm going to take it out of the water, and I'm going to set it right there. Now I'm going to get my brush and dip it into the micro set, and I'm just going to put a fairly generous amount on there. Sometimes if the surface is super glossy, um, it will beat up. Just keep applying it because once you put the decal on it, it'll spread out underneath the, uh, the decal. And then I'm going to take the tweezers and the decal. Now I live dangerously. You may not want to do it this way, but I use the tip of my hobby knife. And I'm just going to slide that into place like that. Now I'm just going to gently nudge that around to get it positioned where I want it and aligned how I want it, like that. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to take this Q-tip. Now what I do on a larger decal like this is I stick it very gently right in the middle to get it in place. And then I roll one way and then back to the middle and then roll the other. What I'm doing there is I'm working out any of the bubbles and moisture that's underneath it. If you just start from one side and start pushing across, you're going to slide the decal. But by gently putting it in the middle the first time, you're going to work that water out from under there, that setting solution. Because the decal is actually floating on top of that. Um, if you have enough water on there, you may have seen this, that you can, you know, it'll, it'll be sitting there and you can touch your q-tip or something next to it and it'll start soaking up that water and it'll start moving around on the surface on you so to make sure that i don't get any slide i just do that and after i've rolled it a few times then you can start working a little harder and start pushing in a little more and i'm putting good pressure on it i mean i'm not breaking anything but i want to work out any bubbles from underneath that decal so they don't show up when i put on a matte coat now I'll give this, um, generally what I do is, is I'll go through and put on most of the decals on a section. Like I'm going to do the shoulders and the torso. Um, I'll do it off camera, but I'm going to do the shoulders and the torso. Once I get through with all of those, I'll go in and put the solve -a set on them. I feel like solve -a set works best if you give these a little time to dry, um, and not just put it on there immediately. For one, if you start putting solve set on right after it's been put on, sometimes the solve set will float it off. So you want it to dry just a little bit, put on the solve set. When you're using some setting solutions like solve set how many times can I say solve set in one paragraph? Anyway, um, 
sometimes when you're using those, they will wrinkle up the decal. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't try and smooth it out. Don't do anything with it. 99% of the time, after about a few hours, just leave it overnight even, it's going to smooth back out. If it doesn't smooth out, all you need to do is, once it's completely dry, is make a few slices in the areas that it's not smoothed out. Apply a little more solve set, and that should settle it down. If, after applying solve set, you get later on in the build, you're putting on the matte coat, and you see little bubbles in there, what I generally do is either take a needle or just the tip of my hobby blade, and I make a little slice where the bubbles are. And then I touch the solve set to it again, and that'll usually get in there under it and take care of it. Other ways to deal with if you've got if you've got an area that you you know you really missed getting the air out, and you've got lots and lots and lots of tiny little bubbles under it, there's several ways to handle that if if the solve set trick doesn't work. One is if you notice it early enough, um, like right after you do the decals, but before you do any weathering, you can actually go in with your paint and just touch up. Uh, the paint because it's only going to show where the lettering is not. So if it shows up through the clear film, well, you can touch that up with paint and that'll take care of this, the silvering underneath. Or you can say, okay, there's this one little thing here, this little silvering, or there's a few of them there, and I can't, I can't seem to get rid of it. When you do your weathering, that's where your chipping goes. <laughs> so you can cover it up with chipping, you can cover it up with paint, you can put a slice in it and put some solve set in it. Um, there's a lot of ways of treating that. If the decals you're using have a lot of clear film overhanging the edges, these Bandai ones are pretty good, but if it has a lot of clear film overhanging the edges, you can, um, you can trim off that film that hangs out from either side, from all the sides of the decal. That reduces the amount of area that you're having to, uh, that you're having to, 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 uh, have potential for bubbles to be under. On very large decals, sometimes I'll even like if it's, you know, a zero or O or something like that, I'll actually cut out the film from the middle of the decal so that I don't have to worry about that big expanse of decal having any kind of uh, bubbles under it because there won't be any film there. You have to handle the decal a little more gentle, but it'll, it'll eliminate the need for that. So I'm going to continue working around the mobile suit. There's a lot of decals. Um, you don't want me to film all of those. I'm just going to do this one because I think it shows the the point. And uh, I'm going to cut back in here in just a second after I give this some time to dry and show you applying the salt. Uh, show you, you're not going to be applying the salt set. I'm going to be applying the salt set. Anyway, I'll show applying the salt set so you can see how much I use um, on here. All right, this decal has had uh, about 10 minutes to dry, which is plenty sufficient. And what I'm going to do is take a different brush than I use for my micro set. I always use two brushes, one for the micro set, one for the solve set. And I'm getting a good amount on there and I'm painting it on essentially, making sure to get over the edge. I want it to go past the edge of the clear film. And I'm going to put that on there and then I'm going to stop and leave it be. If you keep stroking the brush on there, it's going to start softening the decal and you'll start smearing the decal. I mean, it'll literally smear across the model. So you, you put it on there and then you leave it be. If you look at it and realize you didn't get enough of it on there, at this point, I don't want to touch it. In fact, if you look closely, there's little chevrons there. You can just begin to see some of it bubbling up. That'll bubble up. That's normal. Sometimes it's more severe than that. It depends on the brand of decals, but that'll bubble up, um, which is normal. And like I said, you leave that sit for a few hours and it's going to be good to go. Now, if you need to go back later and apply some more solve set, let it dry, apply some more solve set. If there are any panel lines or details around it, uh, then once it's dry, what I do is I take my, my X-Acto knife and I cut through the panel line. So I cut through the decal and then right there along the panel line, I apply some more solve set. I let that soften it up and dry. And then I'll go back later and check it. And if I need to do a cut one more time, um, so that it, while this stuff will pull it down in the panel lines, I think it always looks better to run 
your knife through it and then apply some more solve set, you're going to get a much better appearance in the end. But I'll let this dry now for several hours. And when I'm finished with all of the decals, what I'll do is either go back, depending on the number of decals I have on the model, I'll either go back and just touch it up with some more gloss coat over it to seal it against the future weathering. Or in the case of this one, because there's going to be stencils all over it, I may just go back with my airbrush and recoat the whole thing so that I seal in the decals and everything else. Um, and it won't later weathering steps won't hurt them. All right. Having said all of that, I'll now take the time to put on gazillion T other decals and show you what that looks like when it's all finished. About three hours time later, working time, I'm done. I got all the decals on. And as I was putting them on, the, the decal sheet looked like there were just a whole lot. As I was working on them, I realized there's not, I mean, there's not a terrible amount on here. Um, there are a lot of little stencils, but um, when you spread them out across the suit, they don't actually look like that much. Um, but I like, I like the balance of it. Um, I, I, I personally have this pet theory that, you know, given the scale, the decals shrink it down actually. Um, because if you've ever looked at say an airliner, when you're standing, this is one 100 scale. So it should be, it should look like an object would look relatively if you're standing a hundred feet from it. If you've ever stood a hundred feet from say an airliner, you don't see hardly any of the stenciling on the airliner. You get up close and you see that there's quite a bit of it. So I've always thought that the stencils um, around the mobile suit kind of shrink it down. They make it look like it's a smaller scale than it actually is. But at the same time, I think they add visual interest uh, so I, I went ahead and went with them because um, there are a lot of expanses of big chunks of armor on this thing and they kind of help break it up visually and give some, some points of interest across the mobile suit. But um, they went on really well. One thing I meant to point out, on the larger decals, I did put the solvent, not the solvent set, the micro set under them. On these smaller ones, I didn't do that because once I put them down with water and clean the water out from under them and then touched it with the solvent set, they're small enough that the solvent set just goes underneath them anyway and, uh, and draws them down onto the, the surface of the model. So I, I didn't do the, the micro set on all of the decals, just on some of the larger ones. Now this one here, this one was a bit of a challenge because it had the decal backing all around here, a very large chunk of it. And I went in and I cut out like a little triangle of it here. I, I don't know if you can see it in the light. You may be able to see where I cut out the backing paper, but I cut it out in part of the Z, in between the letters, in the O, the triangles in the N, up in here. Because a big one like this, it can be really difficult to not get silvering. After I put the decal down, let it dry, hit it with some, um, some solva set, let that dry. I looked at it later and saw that there were some air bubbles. So I did exactly what I talked about uh, previously. I think I talked about it. If not, I'm talking about it now. Um, I just made some very light slices where the bubbles were and put some more solva set on that. And, uh, it took, it took two or three, passes at that just to get it down where I wanted. There's a few places that there's still some little bubbles, but that's where I'm going to add some targeted chipping, um, which will uh, uh, get rid of that. But when you have these really large decals, sometimes they can be a challenge. Now you can cut them into the individual letters and cut out, you know, almost all of the film. I didn't do that because Sometimes it can be hard to get everything aligned back up and it looks a little wonky and I figured I'd rather I'd rather fight with the, with a few bubbles than try and line everything up because I'm horrible at lining things up. Um, when your hands do this all the time, uh, it's, it's hard to get things lined up. So uh, I went with that, but this big one was a little bit of a challenge.
But overall, I'm really happy with how the paint turned out, how the decals look on this guy. Uh, I, I, I'm liking where it's going, and I, I really love these these colors. They're coming from an aircraft background to, to be using, you know, pink and red and things like that. Um, it's kind of cool to use some alternative colors that, that I, I never would have used on a Spitfire or a P-40 or anything like that. So this has been a lot of fun. One other quick note, when you've got a lot of decals to work on, what I do to try and, um, you know, not get frustrated by the sheer number of them, I'd mentioned earlier that I work a section at a time, and as I go through and, and add the decals on, I mark off that I've done those already so that, um, one, it gives me something that I can look at and I can see that, you know, okay, I'm making progress, uh, this is getting done but also it will, it will remind me what I've already done so I won't be looking, well, where's that decal or did I already do that when I know I've done that. So like some of these decals, they went like on the waist here. These are the same right there. So I would do these like four at a time. I would put these two here, these two there, get them dealt with and mark it off. And then I'd flip it around to the other side and I'd do those two and those two. You know, so I, I don't always do them individually. Sometimes I'll do them four at a time and just hold the decal paper and slide one off and then the next and the next and the next. Then get all of them positioned at one time. Then, you know, do it that way. So you, you, have, to, you have to use some, some mental tricks to keep yourself engaged in decaling because I, quite honestly, if I ever become, you know, Mr. Mega YouTube guy making millions of dollars and PewDiePie is going to be calling me for interviews <laughs> like that'll ever happen. Um, and I could afford it. I'm going to hire somebody to put decals on models for me because that's, that's one of the things that I just get so bored with doing, but it is necessary. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, the next video, of course, will start the weathering. I don't know whether it's going to take me one or two more episodes of this series to to weather uh, this guy. I do plan on it being a very involved process involving a lot of techniques, a lot of layers. Um, I'm not going to, this is not going to be a, a quick down and dirty weathering job. I really want to uh, to get involved with it and, and I guess you'd say uh, show an advanced weathering uh, uh, video tutorial kind of thing and and really really take some time to do it and and get in a lot of things on it. So be sure if you haven't already done so, be sure and subscribe in the little link down there somewhere and hit the bell icon so you'll know when I've uploaded a new video. And I would appreciate that so very much. And if you wouldn't mind leaving a comment on the video, I always like hearing from people and how, how they like the videos and, and what they like and you know what they do and and uh, just kind of getting a conversation going. So please leave a comment down below. And also, while you're looking down below, there's some links to the social media that, that I'm on. And if you're on some of those social media platforms, I would love if we could connect and uh, uh, get to know each other that way and, and keep up with the work we're doing. Because again, I like to hear from people and uh, how they're, they're doing things and what they're working on. So please, uh, please feel free to engage in that way also. And there's also a link down below to Patreon. That's how I support uh, the work that I do. Uh, I could not model at the pace that I model with the equipment that I use and the materials that I use and fund the website and everything else without Patreon. So it's, it's, it's really what keeps me going to do, to do the things that I do. So if, if you find these helpful and you are able and inclined, I would love it if you would sign on as a patron, uh, look at the various levels that are available there, and, uh, and sign on to support me. And if you're already a patron, thank you so much. You, you make all of the work that I do possible, and I am most very grateful for that. And uh, my family and I appreciate your support and, and you coming alongside to, uh, to make sure that, that I'm able to do this uh, in, in the way that I do it. You know, we couldn't do it without you, so thank you very much. And as always, I'll leave you with one final thought. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.